So you can see that here's the patient's in the lateral position. Here's the tip of the greater trochanter. This is the vastus tubercle. And the incision I make is a short posterior incision, about the width of my hand. I go five finger breaths up the back of the uh, trochanter. And uh, this incision has, has given uh, superior results. It's the incision that's used in the reports from Mayo where they've compared the posterior incision to other anterior incisions we've published on it. These, uh, with this incision, patients can go home the same day, even the next day. Gait analysis shows that the, at six weeks, there's no difference with this incision from any other incision, including the direct lateral incision. So muscle injury or, or recovery time is essentially equal. There's less pain medication used, at least in the literature with this incision. So we divide the gluteus maximus. I usually do that uh, with the bovi. It can be just split. Then we divide the fat over the back of the greater trochanter. I feel over the top of the piriformis. You can see we have long handled retractors. It makes it easy for the assistant. And you can see the fat in the back of the trochan greater trochanter. And Larry, you're going to be sparing the piriformis as you do this procedure, correct? Yes, I am. So that's why I'm going to just try and show it if I can. It's right here under my finger. It's got fat over the top of it. So there's the piriformis right there. You can see a little bit of the white of it. I'm going to come up directly parallel to it, right down to the bone, and then make an L-shaped incision. I'll save the quadratus also. You can see the capsule here now. So I'm just opening the capsule. The gamelli are on top of it and they're just opened with it. Now you can see the femoral head exposure. And I come down to the edge of the acetabulum. And I go under the quadratus to try and not get the medial circumflex and I just open the capsule along the neck. And at that point, I will try and dislocate it. And we were successful. A little worried about that ossifite, but didn't have to. So let's have the uh, old three. So now you see the neck. And then what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take this retractor. I'm gonna put it down under the um, lesser trochanter so that I have access to the lesser trochanter. I need that. Some people like to measure from the lesser trochanter when they're operating manually. I need that just to be able to register the femur into the software for the robot. Now here, right here, by palpation is the corner of the inner trochanteric ridge and the lesser trochanter. So right there I make a little divot into this so that I can put the screw in for registration. And while I'm putting the screw in, we're gonna put the, uh, on the computer screen. And so you can see the femoral plan for the uh, robot. The femoral plan sizes the femur, and it's a size five stem on this plan, and that's the same size that I did um, template on the x-ray. Right, so then you've had a, an x-ray template and then you've also got a yes. CT scan of this patient and we are using the uh, MAKO robotic assist to convert what's in the computer with the CT scan and then actually to the patient's anatomy as he's putting in this uh, very tight uh, femoral array screw which has to stay there because you have to keep going back to it and you'll see that as uh, we continue with the procedure. Now he's now putting the, uh, the femoral array on and that's gonna be read by the camera up at the head of the patient. And then he will go about mapping the femur. And the mapping of the femur on the patient is then matched with the femoral map that's in the CT scan within the computer. And as those two things are melded together, 
then the opportunity to place things in the, in the very best position is there, and what we're looking for is uh, longevity of system. Okay, so we just have to hit this checkpoint twice. That uh, is a way to be sure that the array is accurate. If the array screw gets loose, then the checkpoint number will deviate, and we'll know that, that we don't have accuracy on that FEMA registration anymore. We put three points onto the femur, registers into the software, and then after that we have to put 30 points that uh, gives the software the uh, ability to correlate the registration in the body to the CT correlation that was taken preoperatively. And so he'll touch all these points and, uh, and turn them. And as he does that, that moves right into the computer. So again, just, just melding the, uh, the two together so that we have the actual patient anatomy and the, uh, and the CT scan. And that's matched up within the computer of the uh, Mako robotic assist arm. And he's down to uh, one, two, and so that's, that's about one minute for the full registration. The computer is now reading all the numbers, reading what he's got. You see an all green and no red, so that means the computer is going to accept this registration, and these, there's one, two reds there, one up at the, at the saddle and one down by the lesser trope. He's going to touch these blues and turn them white, which is further confirmation of uh, what we have, and that's just giving the, the outline of the actual patient uh, anatomy of the femur. That's t that was a little bit, little bit far off. He finally touches down the last one, and now this is going to read it, and it will match it. Okay, so now we've registered, and now what the next step now that we have the registration is that we will mark where we we're going to put the neck cut. The uh, neck cut can be uh, accurately marked because we know the center of rotation of the acetabulum. That's been established from the pre-op planning on the CT scan, and I will go over that as we get to the acetabulum, but I'm going to mark where I need to make that saw cut from the neck, and you can see that I'm and just a be, little below that. Yeah, you can be very order, accurate please. with this cut. Also going to double check my cut. I wanted about 15 from there, so that's a manual check. And he's just doing a secondary check just to confirm. So every time we we confirm what the computer does manually, and that pretty much it's always that way. Over a little. I've got an osteophyte on this femur, which just makes it a little tougher to get out. There's usually lateral capsule attached. So I'm going over and get that. And we see we're pretty much right on the cut, so that's good. So he's checking his cut to make sure that it's so exactly where he thought it was. We're done with the femur there for, with that, and we're gonna do the routine broaching preparation of the femur. So we put the retractors in for that. And this tool nicely clears the lateral neck, so helps keep your stem out of varus. So he's trying to get back because if, the, if you can't get down straight if you don't get back to do it. So he's getting back into that uh, cortical bone right at the, uh, at the neck saddle. So you can see, we see the whole neck. We're able to do that. We just put a starter brooch in. Now we just, we'll progressively brooch up oh, to size. These brooches are actually compressing bone as he goes down, so it really, really makes it a, a nice snug fit throughout. That's a four, correct? I think we're gonna quit there. Now, let me have the array and the antiversion device. Okay, now he's gonna read directly what this uh, antiversion is with the femoral component in. And it sometimes will change from what the computer has read the antiversion off the CT scan of the medial and lateral epicondyle. The CT scan and said the femur, femur had 15 degrees of antiversion. So that's pretty normal antiversion. That doesn't mean the stem will go in at 15. 
We'll just see what it is here. That array looks directly at the degrees. camera. And so it gives us, I can't quite see it, Larry. Is it 20? 20. Okay. So it's actually five more than the CT scan read. Yeah. And but actually, that's where uh, it went. Roger Emerson has said that tapered stems can go in at greater anniversary. I agree with that. I mean, it looks like that to me. Now we'll put the S to have the retractors in. We put a posterior superior retractor in to pull that capsule back. Now, now we're looking down in, look, give me the pretty, Charlie pin. Pretty complete exposure of this uh, acetabulum through yeah. this mini incision. One of the things that helps it is, uh, is to be able to roll the, the table back 20 degrees so that he has direct access. This is the yeah, Charlie yeah, pin going up superior. Will. And now he's going to do a complete uh, labral excision. Which yep. is important because you, you don't want to register on soft tissue, you want to register on bone. That's what the CT scan has, has shown you. You know, I grew up in Iowa, and there was a surgeon in Mason City, Iowa, a very high volume surgeon, that used to always say that you had to take the labor out because it, if you didn't, patients hurt more. I've never seen a study on it, but you know, I've always remembered what he said. And I always do take it out. Here's some of that osteophyte we saw on the x-ray. And that's free from the acetabulum. You, you really don't take osteophyte off until after you've registered because it can affect the acetabular registration, but that's not attached. But that was actually a loose fragment loose piece. basically. It's a loose piece like this. Yeah. A loose body. So now the next thing we do is I'm going to put a check screw in here and while the check screw is being put in we're going to put the acetabular plan up on the uh, screen for you to see what the plan with the acetabulum is from the CT scan. You can go over that with them if you want to Dickie. Yes sir I will. Um, here's, here's the acetabular. Size 60 acetabulum. Yeah. Here's the acetabular plan. You can see it in the uh, coronal plane and then the transverse plane. Probably we look at the transverse plane a little bit more than the coronal plane, but it's, the CT scan is segmented uh, down in Fort Lauderdale where Mako is, and they, they actually get the ideal position for the acetabulum. The physician is still in charge. He can go back and, uh, and change it as he, as he uh, needs to. And again, because we've done femur first and know where we are, we can change to combined antiversion to get our best number for combined uh, antiversion. We touched that twice. If and then, at, uh, Lisa, uh, go back to the uh, plan one second. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, you see two numbers. That's the inclination and antiversion I've set for this cup. I can change that. I'll never change the inclination because I never want more than 40. And uh, because I, I know there's some error here, somewhere between two and five degrees. So I don't want to ever be above 45, so I set it for 40. I really like 38, it's kind of my favorite. Uh, 20 version, I can switch. If I have a high antiversion on the stem, I may take it down to 15, which I sometimes do with this plastic women. And if I have a very low antiversion, like I have in men with cam impingement, I can take that antiversion all the way up to 30, although I very rarely go above 25, rarely. If I have a 28 head, uh, because I have a very small cup, I'll take the antiversion of this cup to 20 or 25, and I may add a hood. Do that commonly with the 28 head. Putting the hood apex for this left hip would be at 4 o'clock. So it's not in the way of external rotation abduction. So those numbers, then you see the three uh, transverse numbers. It means the center of rotation is one millimeter inferior and five millimeters medial and centered anterior posterior for comparison to what the native acetabulum is. And if you look at the picture, you see the green center is the center for the native, the magenta is where the stem would be and the same thing on the one up above. So you know your comparison of your center of rotation it never changes. That's why we could do this femur cut with confidence because we know our center is not gonna change. Center's not gonna change because the robot won't let me over ream. It won't let me make a mistake. When we're reaming, there's basically a fail safe mechanism. So uh, I'm gonna let Lisa register here and 
just touching everything out here. This is, uh, again, it's, it's going to be a, a, a robotic guided and robotically assisted. And what this really does is it, is it does, uh, does, does something that uh, navigation doesn't do, and it gives you both accuracy and precision in your uh, operative intervention, and again, individualized for each patient. Yeah, I think the big difference, because I've done computer navigation for years too, I think the big difference is in the ASTAB is having the center of rotation, the accuracy of the center of rotation, because the accuracy of center of rotation is what makes the restoration of the leg length and offset um, so more predictable. And so that's one of the things I really, really like. I like to know that my center of rotation is controlled. And then secondly, I think the... Uh, the fact that there's a fail-safe mechanism with the reaming. You know, I do computer navigation, but that doesn't mean I sometimes don't manually over-ream, ream too far, ream too deep, ream too superior. The only real reason that we need offset stems is because we ream too superior. You know, in Bob Bourne's article where he described the need for it, his average uh, mean cup position was five millimeters superior. So that's the real reason you need an offset stem because if you get up superior like that, you need an offset stem to keep the length of the gluteus medius correct. You want to keep that length of the gluteus medius correct so that the patient has a good gait and doesn't hurt. So uh, I think most of the time you, you, you can expect that you won't need an offset stem when you have control of the center of rotation and uh, don't overring the acetabulum. However, you still may need it sometimes. And sometimes there's real varus hips and they should have an offset stem just from the uh, shape of the femur. So it's not, it doesn't obviate the complete uh, elimination of that. I think the other, I think the biggest problem with the acceptance of these machines is that it causes change in the OR. And uh, for me personally, Dickie, the, one of the very satisfying things for me is that with using the machine in the OR, I know that with every patient I operate, I give them the same equal chance for an equally, equally superior result. And when I operate, based on my experience and my instincts, I'm pretty good, been doing it a long time, my data is clearly in the literature, but I still have outliers. And every patient that walks into me wants to be the one that doesn't have an outlier. And this gives me the best chance to be able to tell every patient that I'm going to do your operation right. So, so it's reproducible and it's reliable, and the robotic assist helps you do that. He's going ahead and, and removing medial osteophyte now because this was kind of a, an outward subluxation. So now he's just removing these big osteophytes. Yeah. This is a big inferior and somewhat posterior osteophyte. Uh, we saw that on the on the x-ray that there's a big osteophyte. So we knew he was going to have to deal with it both on the x-ray and on the CT scan. So I can feel the transverse ligament is still there. Somebody really likes that for a guide. So some people guide. When you have a big osteophyte like this, it really helps take it down because otherwise it went, it tends to, the robot tends to want it. And I like to single ream. So I want to put my reamer in, I want to make it go and do it. So that's the way we do it. But I'll take the Aussie fight off to Now he's, he's to hooked up that. to the, he's hooked now up to the VR the arm. on there, please. On the screen, you can see that my numbers are green. Your numbers have to be green for terim. On the vertical numbers, you can see how far I am from being down. So that's how far I have to ream. And the green bone is the bone that needs to go away. When it gets to white, that's good. If it gets to red, okay. then actually the robot will, will stop you. Give me a 58. I'm going to switch to a 58 reamer. He's got such an abnormally shaped acetabulum with this that I'm going down one. Now the computer is reading that this is accurately a 58. Give it to me. It'll go back Something to the pelvic here. checkpoint. You see the array connected to the pelvic pins up here above. 
And you can also appreciate the patient is rolled 20 degrees posteriorly uh, with the entire table being rolled posteriorly for, for better access. Okay. Okay, he now just got his pelvic checkpoint. Degrees. Okay. All right, there's the, the robotic assist arm. Bringing it in. And that yellow down there means that that's the direction to vector with your, with your down hand um, to help get rid of the, the bone necessary to get this accurate and precise acetabular the arena. This patient had a lot of osteophytes, even though Larry took a bunch of them out. He's going to be reaming a lot of bone here. Okay. Drop me down to 56. He's going to go down one size. He's getting a little peripheral ream is, there. Just so he's just going to medialize with a 56, two millimeters smaller. Okay, back over. Oh, blue probe. Blue probe. Checking the size to make sure it is a 56. The computer reads this. Okay. Numbers up here showing where he is. He planned 40, he's around 38. He planned 20, he's around 18. You can see it go red up there, so he's not gonna vector that way anymore. But he's using that right hand to pull down, posteriorly in this case. No. Okay, now go back to 60. So right. that got me down so that I'm, oh, now I just have to enlarge it. You can see that green going away to get the white. Again, the arrow tells you where to vector. And if he goes too far medial, the Rio arm will turn off. It will not allow you to do that. That's the haptic control. Okay, so they're basically all flashing green, which means I'm done. So then I just take a trial while they're switching to a cup and make sure that the trial is tight. It goes down all the way, and it does. So I use that cup. Okay, so now we'll put the cup in. We'll put the cup in with the robot because that allows us to be sure we get the cup in accurately at the numbers we want. We know our center of rotation is controlled, so when the cup goes in, I know my center of rotation is good, and I know my number for inclination and aversion are good. Okay, and so he's going he's gonna to place this uh, acetabular component again with the haptically controlled uh, robotic assist arm so that he makes sure that the way that he accurately and precisely reamed is gonna be also accurate. Okay, you see my numbers up there with my cup now. They're, they say 40, 20, so I'm basically where, where I wanna be. So I pounded it. Right at plan. And I've kept my numbers, and you can see down below, I'm one millimeter from being fully seated. Hit it a couple more times. And I'm down. So we take it out. Down and solid. Down and solid and accurate. One advantage of this plastic is it can be used as both a trial and a real plastic, so you don't have to mess with the trial plastic. So if you want to really go back and, uh, no, he's and test it, you can put it in a trial position. I'm not going back and test it. I know my cup is right, so we mark a little meth in blue because my eyesight's not easy to read that lock. It's either Lisa or it's the blue. That's how I read it. I like a rim of plastic. I know there are a lot of cups today made without a rim of plastic, but if you're going to have any threat of impingement, 
You're better off. This is called a pit play. Now, I'm going to confirm I didn't move it when I knocked on the plastic. Okay. He's going to get Got five one. points here to make sure that he is in, um, in the position that he planned to be in. Down below, it's telling us that we're now 100%. He's got his five points. Okay, it's so now going to read it. It says I was 43 and 21. So if it changes a couple of degrees, then I, that's acceptable because that's in the margin error measurement. If it changes five degrees, my cup was loose. And I better go back and do something about it. So I'm happy with that cup. Now we'll go back and elevate the femoral neck and place the final femoral component two. in. Two always protects the medius. I guess he's going to do a broach trial first before he puts his final in. Let's have a neutral head. Neutral head is according to plan. Then he'll do his clinical range of motion and uh, failure of, of impingements, and then. Okay. okay. Pull. Okay. Just be sure there's no soft tissue in there. That's one thing we want. So what I do here now is I feel the lesser trochanter in relationship to the issue. And that should be in the same position it is on an x-ray. And this one clearly is above the tip of the ischium. And then I bring it to full external rotation and I should be able to run my whole hand across the back of the hip. If I have an impingement of the lesser trochanter or the trochanter, and then up here I should not have impingement of the trochanter, I could put my finger here and I should not have impingement all the way around and I'm in full external internal rotation here and very stable. So we're good in terms of impingement. And, and that's on your clinical test. It's on my clinical test. And I, the next test is we'll check the length clinically. All right, the femoral array is gonna go back on. He's gonna put it through a range of motion. Okay, let's try it again. Notice this number right here is the combined antiversion number in this patient. I think it's uh, 47. We got it. Okay. So it says, our hip length says we're four longer. It's flipping back and forth, four or five longer. We want our five longer, so we're good on our number there. As I said before, I started offset. I'm not real. I don't trust it a whole lot yet. I haven't quite got it totally figured out, but I always wanted a little longer than shorter, and I know my offset's good by manual, so we're good in that situation. So we're going to um, put the stem in. Let's take mm -hmm. this out. So here's the stem, tapered stem, proximal porous coating, distal grip lasting, and smooth at the tip. A little bit like Mallory head. When, it, when this was designed, it basically was designed by trying to take all the optimal features of all the stems that have worked the best. And so the Mallory head was one of the better stems, and this keeps it from pistol tip fixing, which the accolade had, initial accolade had trouble with. So we've got porous coating, distal grip lasting, smooth tip, tapered stem. So there's a stress gradient transition here and it gives you proximal bone loading uh, through the ingrowth of the porous coating. It gives you on growth in the corundomized mid stem and you get no distal fixation because of the smooth tip. And uh, the other thing is with the rectangular shape, the rotational stability has right. always been the best with that shape. The thicker AP dimension up proximally. Okay, that stems down where it wants to go. There's a little bit of coating so showing, you can see. Try one more time. And that's it. Because the stem's a little bigger than the, one millimeter bigger than the broach, 
Sometimes it doesn't go quite as deep. There's a, there's a question about HO prophylaxis. Uh, I know well, I that use aspirin, and aspirin is HO prophylaxis. Aspirin, aspirin only. That's that's all that uh, that I ever used. And, uh, and that's and all I've used in my it, career. Ever keep since it going I for a while. Let me have the baby jaws. Not too hard. Just don't see Man, HO. I'll tell you, you don't see HO. Don't see I remember it. the first time Tom Druin came to review my X-rays years ago, in the early 90s, when we were doing APR one, and he went through all the X-rays and he said. You have the most fascinating x-rays, he said, because you don't have any HO. So the stem anniversary is 15 degrees. It's a little different. That's this number up here. That's a little different than we got but on the road. But that's uh, OK, because it's still good. But that's good. what it is. And uh, the stem, as I said, is a little bigger, so it might be the reason we have a little less anniversary. Now we'll take the trial head. And we'll reduce that. Okay, and I'll feel it one more time. All right, he's going to do his clinical tests again, and we're just about ready to go to HSS. While he's testing, I'd like to say, great job, good SAM team. So we'll just and show you the antiversion one more time. We can show you the antiversion with the stem in. Let me have the uh, vape. Let me have the nine and the array. And once you've done the antiversion, you don't have to do it twice. Baby jaws. So we just have to put it on and it'll record. So he's putting that femoral array back back into the femoral array screw, and it's going to read. So it's a little bit long. We were five millimeters longer with the uh, brooch. So um, we'll go back to our neutral head, which will make us five, because as I said, the stem is more at the level where the cut was. So our plan came out very well. Our plan was for five longer with the neutral head, and with the neutral head, we're going to be five longer. Uh, offset, I wasn't quite so worried about. If we look, go through the whole list now, this is what you get for your final. You know what you got. I got 43 of inclination. I got 21 of, an, of aniversion. I have a version of 15 degrees on the femur. So I have a combined aniversion of 36 degrees. The mean combined anaerobic should be 35 degrees, so that's very good. And right we already on. talked about length and offset. So I think, uh, Dickie, that uh, we did uh, a good job of, of accomplishing our plan today. I think we got done in a reasonable period of time. And I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for uh, watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you, team, and uh, thank you, audience. I think that the longevity of the procedure is dependent on uh, implant positions. It's a false marketing out there today that says that the incision, whether it's posterior or anterior, will prolong the outcome of an operation. The comfort of a hip replacement for the patient and the longevity of that operation is totally dependent on the biomechanical reconstruction, which is the uh, implant positions, the offset, and the leg length. If you don't get that right, I don't care what incision you go through, you're going to have uh, an unhappy patient, likely, and a hip that will fail faster. So it's really, really important that the implants are, uh, are, and the biomechanical reconstruction is as precise as possible. And it doesn't matter. There's no scientific data that says it matters whether you go front, back, sideways, middle. Just get into the hip whatever way. You do it the best. And then when you get in there, the one advantage, as I showed today, is that with the machine, you can get the parts in accurately, you can get the biomechanical reconstruction, you can walk out of the operating room with a really good feeling that this patient's got as good a hip replacement as you can perform. I think the most important features of the operation I did today was to show the ease of use of the robotic uh, computer navigation in the operating room and to show how it makes the operation easier for the surgeon by giving quantitative numbers for the procedure that you're doing. I think the quantitative numbers allows me to have a very reproducible operation. I can do the same operation for every patient because I know what I have and where my implants are and my biomechanical reconstruction I can achieve to the plan that I set for it so that uh, 
for me, uh, that's, that's the most important feature of this using a machine in the operating room. I feel probably the most satisfaction that I can tell every patient that I can give them my superior ability uh, to do this operation uh, to uh, an accurate and precise uh, completion. And that's, that's, uh, that's very satisfying to me.